Thanks, Jean, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, as you said, today I'm going to be talking about iodide and pyodide, which are tools for bringing data science workflows to the web and to the browser in particular. So really briefly, what we'll be talking about is I'll show you iodide, which is an experimental tool we've been building to bring these uh, familiar, interactive, and iterative data science workflows that you all know from things like Ian's talk in, in Jupyter Lab to the web. We'll be talking about Pyodide, which brings Python into the browser. I'll briefly talk about the Iodide server, which kind of ties this together, and then we'll have time for questions. So, Iodide is a tool for bringing data science communications workflows into the browser. So there are a couple different kinds of data science workflows that you guys are probably familiar with. There's code-focused workflows, so those are going to be things where the, the thing that you're trying to produce is really um, code. The artifact at the end of the day is production software. So a workflow like that might be something like producing a machine learning algorithm to optimize click-throughs or something like that. The workflows have this critical exploratory phase where you're going to be using tools like RStudio or Jupyter to explore your data, to produce plots, to try out different models. And at the end of the day, you might switch to something like VS Code to kind of productionize your code. Another workflow is a communication-focused workflow. So in that case, the, the thing you're producing is something more like a document. And in this case, the focus really is communication. So this will be like doing exploratory data analysis where you're looking through a stack of data to try to come up with some kind of pattern that might influence a decision. Again, these workflows have this exploratory phase where you're going to be using tools like Jupyter or RStudio. And then hopefully, at the end of the day, you can either pass off a, a notebook or maybe um, a similar like, like R Markdown document to your collaborators. But sometimes you might have to switch to a PDF or you might have to switch to a more traditional document of some kind. And today, like I said, we're going to be talking about this communication-focused workflow. So there are these, uh, these great researchers down out of the, the UCSD Design Lab who have actually been doing a lot of really interesting user research on computational notebooks. And they, they had this paper that was kind of making the rounds a few months ago um, called Exploration and Exploration in Computational Notebooks. They analyzed I think 1.2 million Jupyter notebooks, something in that range, and they did a lot of user research and interviews with, with users of Jupyter and um, similar technologies. And they found that workflows often had these two critical phases, this exploration phase and then this explanation phase. We also have found in our work at Mozilla that there's this collaboration phase that we need to, to bring into this loop. Um, and ideally, all of this would happen in, in a tool like Jupyter or R Markdown, where you'll do your exploration in your notebook, you'll hand that off to the, the decision makers or the collaborators to, um, to look at that explanation. They can immediately take that notebook, start hacking on it, remixing it, and join in in that collaboration, and that cycle will continue. In practice, this is sometimes a little more uh, complicated or a little more involved. Um, the exploration really in my experience and our experience at Mozilla, uh, Jupyter is, a, is the best tool for that uh, by far, things like Jupyter and RStudio again. For the explanation phase, we often find that in our workflows, like our product managers and our executives often have trouble dealing with this combination of, of code and explanation and that, that mixture. And so oftentimes what we'll end up doing is copying kind of like our key plots, data tables, um, analyses, summary statistics, that kind of stuff back out to a Google Doc or a PDF or something like that. And then maybe at the top of that doc, we'll leave a link back to the code. So for people who are interested, they can go and take a look at that notebook and remix it and adapt it to their needs. And this experience is not at all idiosyncratic. So if you guys have encountered this before, you're not alone. This is what these, these researchers, again, found a lot of people are doing, is people will do their exploration phase in a Jupyter notebook, but when it comes time for explanation, they'll extract those key figures and those key data points and put them into another more traditional document format. So um, that's one part of a, a communication workflow. Another thing that I want to mention really briefly here is um, interactive data viz. So in modern communication workflows, interactive data viz is really important and buys us a lot, right? And so we're all familiar with things like this 538 interactive data viz, which is going to be in D3. And this has these nice kind of like things where you can hover over the plots and it will drill in and give you a little bit more insight into what's going on. Or you can really dive down into um, the various features of a, of a map or whatever else it is. What's great about this kind of interactive data visualization is it allows you to get the high level overview while at the same time drilling down into the details of the data that you're interested in. Um, 
And that kind of thing is, is hard if you're working with a, a static artifact. So if you're copying figures to a Google Doc, you can't really do that kind of, um, that kind of interactive visualization because you need computation to be close to presentation for this kind of thing to work, right? Whenever you're hovering over one of those elements of that map, a little bit of code is being run that's altering the UI on the fly. So um, we just saw in Adam's talk the, the Lorenzo Tractor demo. Um, let me bring that up. Unfortunately, in my, this, this binder, I don't know why it's not working now, but Interact isn't working here anymore. Uh, well, maybe nothing's working right now. In any case, we just saw, for those of you who are here for Adam's talk, you just saw the, the Jupyter Lab demo. Um, you can see in this screenshot here, Jupyter does allow some of this, this nice interactivity, and it's getting better and better, as, as, um, as we just saw. Like it's, it's improving by leaps and bounds. Um, what that demo was going to show is there are these little sliders, and if you pull them back and forth, it actually updates the uh, parameters of the Lorentz attractor. So you can kind of dig in and explore a little bit with some of that interactivity what that, um, what that model looks like. So um, what I want to show you now is how that would look in iodide. So again, iodide is this experimental tool that we're building at Mozilla to try to bring some of the, the tools that we're familiar with as data scientists um, to the web. So here's what a similar explanation would look like in, a, in a, an iodide notebook. And the first thing you should notice is that it doesn't look like a notebook at all. It looks like a web page with a write-up. So um, it's just, it's, a, it's like a standard text and you have this graphic that you can hover and zoom and scroll around on and it's all the computations happening in the browser next to the presentation. So you get all of the advantages of WebGL, full motion 3D, all of this kind of stuff. You also can hover over it and as you adjust the parameters of the, the presentation, it all updates in real time. So we're not sending a signal out to a kernel which is rendering a PNG and sending it back to the browser, it's all happening in the browser in real time. So the question you might be asking is, how is this a notebook? Well, it's a notebook because right here we have this explore button in the top corner. And with this one click, you're instantly dropped back into this layer that's the kind of IDE layer that allows you to hack on this chunk of code and edit it for your purposes. So you can see we have something that's it's kind of a hybrid at this point, the UX between something that looks more like RStudio and something that looks like Jupyter. We have this kind of cell-based interface where the code lives on this side. Over here we have a console where you can see the result of evaluations. And over here we have a report preview. So our mental model for this is a little bit different than the mental model you might be used to for something like Jupyter. Again, because we're focused on this concept of document production. We want you to, we want you to have an easy time producing documents that you can share with your collaborators. Um, but we want to make this round trip really tight between this idea of you can hand this nice looking uh, report which gives exactly the presentation you want to see to a decision maker, but then your data science collaborators can easily drop back into the code. And for those semi-technical people, like oftentimes we have a lot of product managers at Mozilla who came from an engineering background, if we can hand them something like this, they can dive into the code and ask that one incremental question without having to uh, install all the dependencies and uh, like install a full Conda environment or whatever the, the similar kind of IT requirements, they can just jump in and start hacking on this stuff and ask an additional question. So um, the thing to take away from this is again that uh, one of, the, one of the, the main differences here between a Jupyter style model and the iodide model is that the, the kernel basically lives, or well, it really does live in the browser. All of the code evaluation is happening inside the browser. So rather than having, uh, in something like Jupyter, or actually in RStudio for that matter, you have what amounts to a browser that renders the UI, but then talks to a remote kernel. Uh, so there's some kind of message passing, which can be fast or slow, and can be fast or low latency, depending on whether you're making a round trip through the internet or not. Um, all of this lives in the browser. And that has some, some nice side effects also with, with respect to uh, sharing of documents and with respect to IT requirements. So you don't need to make sure that everybody has the same um, setup, like the same set of libraries installed and all the same access to the same data and dependencies, because what you actually have is just a web page. And so as soon as anyone goes and hits that web page, all of the resources they need are downloaded. And so everybody's running the same code. 
And just to be clear, we love Jupiter. We think Jupiter is great. I'm drawing these contrasts, but the idea is not to be throwing shade at Jupiter in any way. We think, we think it's an awesome tool. The idea is that we're exploring a little bit different part of the trade-off space. And what we're really trying to do is um, drawing inspiration from things like Jupiter and RStudio, bring the web to data scientists. So we think these are complementary tools, and um, they have a complementary set of trade-offs. And there's one major trade-off that you might be thinking of so far, which is if it's in the browser, are we stuck with JavaScript? So JavaScript has some, some pretty big pros and cons. Uh, on the good side, it's actually very fast. A lot of effort has been put into making JavaScript interpreters some of the fastest available for any interpreted languages. But on the con side, the language has a lot of legacy rough edges. So backwards compatibility is really important in the JavaScript ecosystem. That means that there are a lot of old, kind of crufty, dark corners of JavaScript that if you've used it for any time, you'll, you'll end up running into those. On the pro side, a lot of programmers end up knowing some JavaScript. But on the con side, not that many data scientists do. And that's primarily because there's not really a great data science ecosystem in JavaScript. Uh, there is, on the other hand, a great selection of visualization and UI tools. So trade-offs. But maybe we're not stuck with these trade-offs, actually. So now I'm going to show you Pyodide, which is um, the scientific Python stack compiled to run in the browser. So Pyodide is the first language plugin for Iodide. But it's important to note that this runs outside of Iodide. So if you have the desire to run Python in the browser for one of your projects, you can take Pyodide and you can run it independently for your own projects. Um, what we have in Pyodide right now is base Python, so the Python interpreter itself, which is just the upstream C Python. And we have NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. And all of those are compiled to WebAssembly, which the technical details don't really matter, but it's kind of like a it's like a bit code format for the web. So basically, it's, it allows you to take um, C code, or basically, there are a number of supported language at the, languages at this point. You can compile them to run inside a browser. So let me show you what that looks like. And let me, again, split this out so we can look at our report view and our code console. So again, when I execute a markdown cell up here, that shows up in our report view. So that'll be something that's, that ends up sharing onto our decision makers. What's going to happen next is you see right here we have a Python cell. And that's indicated by this little pie up here in the corner. Right now, the browser hasn't actually loaded Python. So Python can't yet run inside of the browser. What's going to happen when we execute this cell is Iodide's going to recognize that we don't have the Python interpreter installed. It's going to go out to the network and fetch the Python interpreter. It's then going to compile it. It's going to JIT it. And then it's going to eval this Python code. So I'm going to do that now. And it's downloading and initializing. And you see it's done. So Python's actually small. And the JITs are actually pretty fast. So it downloaded the, the data for um, the size of the file for Python is I think it's about like 5 or 10 megs. And then the time to JIT it is actually very fast. So now we can eval Python code in the browser. And we'll just do a simple list comprehension. You see that shows up here. And now we can, we can do some uh, automatic type conversion. So one of the things that's cool about this is we have pretty nice and tight interoperability between this code that's now evaled in the Python environment and our regular JavaScript environment. So in this cell, I've created a little um, Python object. Now this cell here is a JavaScript cell. We can actually import that Python object into JavaScript. And now we can apply a JavaScript map and other JavaScript functions. And that just all works. So that's fine, but what, when this gets really cool is that we can actually also use Python to interact with browser APIs. So right here, here's another Python cell. And what we're doing is we're importing um, iodide, which is our own kind of standard lib that has a few convenience functions. We're also going to import document. And what that does is we're pulling a reference into Python to the document um, API in the browser. And what's going to happen is in this function here where we're going to make some red divs, we're going to take these, these Python strings and we're going to pass them to, there's, there's an automatic type conversion. So we're going to convert them to JavaScript strings. And we're going to pass them to the document API. And that's going to let us create a div. And we're going to ultimately use this function uh, inside of a Python list comprehension to create a few divs. And so what we've done is we've run a little, jo a little Python that's interfacing with the browser APIs and drawing to the DOM. So we can, we can do some cool stuff like that. We can also. Um, Right here, in this case, I've just attached, created this, uh, this, this button here. And attached to that button is this callback function. And so this is a callback function that's written in Python. 
And when I click this button, it will increment this counter. So we're actually using a Python function as a callback for, again, a browser interaction. And that's just like a little simple demo. We can be more elaborate with that. So here I've created a canvas element, and we can actually paint on this canvas. And all the code powering this is, is in Python, but we're interacting with browser APIs to allow you to create this rich kind of experience and interface without having to touch actually that much JavaScript. For those of us who, like me, JavaScript is not their first love. So that's all well and good as far as like cutesy demos. But if you want to do some actual data science work, you're going to need some data science tooling. So let's take a look at uh, NumPy and Matplotlib here. So again, NumPy is not yet available uh, in the browser. We haven't installed it. It's a bit of a bigger package. Um, so we don't, want to, we don't want to be downloading and jitting things that we don't need and having them sit around in memory. So again, what's going to happen is when I go to import NumPy, um, iodide is going to recognize that NumPy is not yet available. It's going to go out to the network, pull it down, jit it, and then evaluate this code. So this is going to take a second longer because NumPy is a little bigger. So you see we're loading here. And now it's jitted and done. You'll see on the second evaluation that most of that, um, most of that latency was really due to the, the JIT, actually. So when I run it again, you can see it happens basically like right away. And uh, same thing with matplotlib. This is going to take a second while it fetches matplotlib. But now matplotlib is here. And you'll see on the next evaluation, again, it happens instantaneously. So here's a plot. And for, uh, for folks who are used to using matplotlib in the, um, in the Jupyter context, you might not be aware that actually matplotlib has this really nice TK-based viewer that lets you do things like um, zoom and pan and kind of scroll around on a plot so you can explore matplotlib plots a little more richly. Because all of this is happening, all, again, the computation is right here next to the presentation, we can do that stuff. So I can pan on the matplotlib viewer here, or we can zoom in on this part of the figure if we want. And we can zoom back out. We can even download a PDF or PNG or whatever, because we're running all of the kind of, basically pretty much the native matplotlib implementation here. And we can write directly to this chunk of video memory, um, rather than passing like PNGs back and forth. Uh, so we can also write, I'm going to let me load Plotly here. So we, we just downloaded Plotly, the JavaScript version of Plotly. Again, this, this nice tight interoperability will let us import a reference to the Plotly library from JavaScript. And we have type conversion again. So I can take the, these um, NumPy arrays that we defined above and just pass them to JavaScript. So I'm going to pass them to Plotly here. And now here's a Plotly graph that is displaying those, um, those NumPy arrays. And again, you could use something like D3. You could use whatever your other favorite WebGL or, or whatever your favorite data visualization library is. And um, to beat the dead horse of the Lorentz attractor, here's the Lorentz attractor again, rendered in matplotlib. And once again, because we have uh, the computation app right here next to the UI, we have the full 3D, uh, 3D orbit version of matplotlib here. So that's Pyodide. Um, the next question you might be asking yourself is, is it is it fast enough to be usable? So here's how to read this plot. The, the vertical red line here is um, native performance. The bars here are multiple of native performance. So orange is for Firefox, blue is for Chrome. Um, Mozilla has been investing pretty heavily in getting WebAssembly to work really well, but we actually expect this gap to close. All of the major browser vendors are, are investing in WebAssembly. So um, right now, Chrome is, is 2x-ish worse, but that's going to get a lot better. The story here, though, is, is there is a performance penalty to, to doing this in the browser, but it's actually it's tractable for a lot of use cases that you might encounter. And um, one thing in particular to notice is that down here um, at the bottom of the graph, there's an area where we're actually very, very close to native. If you look into the details of these benchmarks, you'll find that those are um, those are, those are benchmarks that actually use a lot more NumPy. So if you're actually using like vectorized NumPy for a lot of your operations, that actually calls out to C code on the back end. And when you're using C code, because of the way WebAssembly works, that basically compiles down to, 
to native machine code through WebAssembly. So when you're using something that's like a C library, rather than kind of like, if you're using native Python for big algorithms that do a ton of stuff in Python, you're gonna end up kind of higher up here in the, the, the wave kind of area. But if you're using NumPy and you're really actually pushing a lot of your computation back down to the C layer, you can get very good performance. So again, there are some trade-offs here. There are some things that don't work um, and, and probably will never work. So if part of your workflow that is critical is actually writing to the file system, because we're in the browser, that is not going to work straight away. The browser won't let you, for very good reasons, won't let a web page write arbitrarily to somebody's file system. Same thing with raw network sockets. There are good security reasons why that's not allowed. And the browser doesn't support true subprocesses. Uh, New stuff's being added to the WebAssembly spec all the time, though, and so some of those sub-process-oriented workflows should hopefully be satisfied someday soon by threads and coroutines. And where we're going in the future is to try to get SciPy, like the rest of SciPy, working here. So again, we have NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib at the moment. Um, the next thing up is SciPy, and that'll unlock scikit-image and scikit-learn. The blocker on this is Fortran, and um, if we can talk about this more in the QA if people are interested, but Fortran doesn't, it's a, it's a legacy language and it doesn't have great modern compiler support. So that's blocking getting SciPy running for now. We have, um, we have some ideas about how to solve that. And one of the cool things about getting Fortran working is that once we have Fortran working, R is actually blocked by Fortran. So then we can get R running in the web also. And in the same way that you've seen this, this story about this nice interoperability between passing data structures back and forth between Python and kind of JavaScript to enable these workflows where you can use Python for some of your processing and then maybe JavaScript for your data viz. You can imagine a workflow where you'll use Python for some of your data munging, maybe run your favorite statistical model in R, and then pass that data seamlessly back into, um, into JavaScript to do your data visualization. And at the end of the day, you have rather than serializing and deserializing data, between a bunch of places and having a bundle of files that you need to share to your collaborators, you have this one document that has a mix of uh, Python, R, and JavaScript cells. And so the workflow is, is, is much more kind of seamless and much more tidy and organized. Um, we think in the future that, that the key glue that's gonna tie these runtimes together is Apache Arrow. So we're working with, um, we're working on trying to get Arrow running in the browser and we, well, we actually have Arrow running in the browser. We're working on getting some, a, a nice front end that will make it appealing to work with in JavaScript. We're also working on some stuff around um, Rust, because Rust is another language that targets the browser well. And uh, I don't know if there are many talks about Arrow here this week, but last week at, at PyData in NYC, um, I guess some people from the Pandas team were talking about how they're starting to move to Arrow as their back end for, um, for data processing. And it seems like this is the direction that a lot of data processing is going, so we're, we're eager to jump in with that. Um, we're also working with ConduForge to add WebAssembly as a compile target for um, Conda's build infrastructure. So right now, obviously, you can use Conda to package um, binaries for the different kind of operating system platforms. Um, what this is gonna mean is that without having to rewrite your entire set of build scripts, you just have this other backend and your stuff will run on the web, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and we, we actually, one of our people sprinted with some people from Conda last week and I think we, think we, we cleared out some of the big hurdles there and we see a, a good path forward for that. Last thing I'll mention is the iodide server and I'm just gonna talk about this very briefly. Again, we're trying to tighten this loop between these, these phases of this workflow. Um, because a lot of this stuff lives in the web and because we, we actually have a pretty simple document format on the back, it actually, uh, it, it's a little simpler actually than the, the Jupyter Notebook, the IPy, uh, IPy NB format. And so getting to a Google Docs-like experience actually we think is something that we're going to be able to do pretty quickly. Um, and what we're really working on in terms of this idea of having uh, this optional server is it'll be a place for sharing these reports for doing commenting on the code or on the report side of the, thing, of, the, of the document, for doing collaborative editing, for doing forking merging style workflows, and then for doing archived exports where you can take kind of a snapshot of what was the iodide code base that was involved in this particular project at this particular point in time, what were all of the resources you pulled from the network, 
download all of those and bundle them into like a zip file, and then you'll have a reproducible archive that will run exactly the same forever. Um, the other thing that the server is gonna do for us is act as a, a go-between for, for accessing data sources. So again, this all runs in the browser, and what that means is kind of the default way of getting data into your workspace is to do an HTTP GET request. And what that's gonna do is pull down data from like a, a public um, site on the web. Of course, if you don't want your data to be public, if it's behind auth of some sort, what the server can do is act as a go-between to provide authorization um, or to, to be like an intermediary between something like PySpark. Uh, so that's, that's the other part of what the, what the server is gonna do. And so um, that's it for this, this quick overview of this, of this project. Um, we're very much alpha. This is very much an experiment still. And we would definitely love the help of more people in this community to think about what this could be and to help us build it. So if you're at all interested, uh, hit us up. We're, we're here on GitHub. You can take a look at our code and you can join us. Um, shout out to the rest of the folks on the team. Um, I wanna, yeah, I'll, I'll mention Mike Droteboom in particular uh, did pretty much everything for the, uh, the Pyodide part of this project, so shout out to him. Um, and then, yeah, if you wanna contact me, I'm bcollerin at Mozilla, and again, find us on GitHub. So thanks, we can uh, go to questions. Uh, so what actually is happening on the, no, no we didn't. What's actually happening is that um, the tool that we're using to do the compilation is this tool called mscripten. Um, and it actually does some pretty sophisticated automatic object translation. And so that stuff is all for free. So it just gives you kind of straight away access to the exact names of the, the DOM APIs as they existed. So yeah. So, so it's, 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 we, we didn't add any extra, there's no additional human written code in there. It's all freebie, just based on how Unscripted works. Totally, yeah. So there are, there are a lot of kind of similar projects um, that are doing similar things, like Observable is a tool that is kind of in the similar run JavaScript in, the, in your browser um, space. And, and of course there are things even like kind of, uh, like CodePen and JS Fiddle. Um, so Observable is, is really cool and really interesting. Um, our emphasis, again, is really on this idea of communication. So Observable is like a really cool tool for experimenting with algorithms and exploring JavaScript. Um, what we're trying to do is really open up the space for data scientists to, to get into the web a little more easily, to tell the stories that they might want to be able to tell but that the tooling isn't really there. Like this point in the, in the world of, of web development to, to really um, get into it, you need to like, as you were talking about, as you alluded to in your talk, you have to start, you need to know Webpack and you need to like know NPM and, and there's a pretty high barrier to entry to start writing JavaScript code and getting it out there. So we're just trying to ease that workflow with this kind of iterative, interactive, Similar again to things like Jupyter Lab and R Studio. Uh, as far as like iterative and stuff like that, what happens? Like, let's say I have a document like version one, like how to put it into a state. Uh, I mean, like I have a stock file or something that runs with it, and then you have like that similar problem that you need to like, actually push it to me. Like, so it is a physical document. Yeah, so I guess I'll just show really quickly. Um, so all right, so here's here's our oh, actually let's look at this one. So here's our, our Lorenzo Tractor notebook, for example. And if we just view source on this page, um, what you'll see is that this is actually a pretty simple HTML document. And what we have in here, let me make this a little bigger, is um, we have this this format that we're calling JSMD. So it's like JavaScript Markdown, kind of inspired by R Markdown or um, like MATLAB cell mode. And I think. I think Jupyter now has Jupytext or something like that, which is a, is a mode that's like this. Um, and so what we have is actually a really simple text-based format here. So it's, 
that's actually something that, that we've encountered and that we're trying to be mindful of is, is keeping things human readable, diffable, easy to use in like a regular text editor um, rather than using a, a richer JSON format. Again, there are trade-offs in that. So one of the things that we don't do that, that Jupyter does an awesome job at is when you save a Jupyter notebook, um, it, it kind of bundles all of the artifacts so that you have this thing that has all of the images and everything else that you would want to just, you could just hand that to somebody and they can put it in NB Viewer and see what that looks like. For this, you actually have to run the code. That's an intentional trade-off though because what we're trying to do is enable these live interactive visualization style stories. So um, does that answer that question? Great. Anyone else? All right, looks like not. Well, thank you all for coming.